eyes behold, his eyelids try the children. He's watching us. He's watching the children of men. He's seeing what we do. His eyes are beholding us and it says his eyelids try us. It's trying is like he's testing us. He's watching us. He's seeing how we're going to react in certain situations and he's seeing the way we live our life and the things that we do. The Bible says in the verse 5 there, the Lord trieth the righteous. That word trying, again, it's like a, it's like a testing. Okay, he's, he's trying us. He's, te he's testing us. We are going to go through these trials and these temptations. And he says he tries the righteous. So even, even Job was tried, right? Job was a righteous man. He did what's right. He had some bad things come along in his life, but they were trials. They were temptations. They were things that came to, to show, you know, for, for one of the things was to show how, where Job's heart was. Is he really going to, um, you know, stand with God and not turn his back on him and, and do what's right and maintain his integrity? And this is going to happen to all of us. The Bible says that the Lord trieth the righteous. And the, the title of my sermon tonight is In the Eyes of the Lord because that's what matters the most. He's up there looking at us and we need to make sure that the life that we lead is going to be pleasing in God's eyes. And when we make decisions, the, 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 especially the important decisions, where are we going to work? What are we going to do? You know, um, where are we going to live? All of these different things that, that we decide for ourselves in our life. And even in just our daily life, our daily routine, where do we get our entertainment from? What do we do? You know, wh how, am I, how am I using my time? All of these things need to be looked at from the point of view of in God's eyes, not just in man's eyes. See, in man's eyes or in the world's eyes, they're going to give you a whole different understanding or a whole different perception on, on how we ought to live, what is success, you know, what are the things that we ought to be doing. And um, I'm going to start off here with you know, the way that we view ourselves is often very different from the way that God views us. We all have our own personal view of ourselves. We probably 99% or more, or more think, when you think of yourself, I'm a pretty good person. Right? I mean, I think that about myself. Other people, I'm sure, think that about themselves. You know, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. And um, nobody, very few people think, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a good person. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bad person. I've run into a few people that actually have said that. But... Um, for the most part, you know, we have, we, have, we have a tendency to overlook our shortcomings and our failings and our sin and, and all of the other problems that we have in our life and only focus on the good parts of our life because why would you want to be thinking about the bad parts of your life? I mean, it's, it's understandable, but the way that we view ourselves isn't always the same the way God views ourselves. And we ought to be more concerned with the way that God views us than the way that others view us, or even in the way that we view ourselves. We need to, we need to always be able to take a step back and say, what, did, what would God think about this? What is, what is his view on, on whatever topic, whatever belief, whatever anything, the, the way that I'm living? How would God view us? And one of the things that's real common out there, and we just, I just talked to someone today. Um, he was a teenager, I think, looked like a teenager, was in the Catholic Church. And oftentimes people have this misunderstanding of sin. And when I get to the part of explaining about the punishment for our sins being hell, and that it's not just the really bad sins, or I like to ask people, you know, what do you think a person can do in order to deserve such a bad punishment of hell? And the most common answer people say is murder, right? Of course. Yeah, well, if you kill somebody, yeah, I mean, you, you know, God's going to send you to hell for that. You deserve hell. And the problem is that people have a tendency to downplay the seriousness, the gravity of sin, just because things are more common. Okay? For example, telling a lie. We, I, I, you know, we always point that out because in Revelation 21, 8, it gives that whole list and, and finish up saying, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And 
it's a great verse because it's listing murderers in the same exact sentence as liars. It has, it has them all included there. So people say, oh yeah, see, look, there's murderers, right? Murderers deserve like a fire, but look at this, it says liars. And what people have a tendency to do is they're not, they're not thinking about sin in God's eyes. They're thinking about it in man's eyes. Well, well, everybody does that. I mean, you, are you trying to say we all deserve to go to hell? Of course not. That's, that would be ridiculous. That's extreme. That's only for the really bad people. That's what man would think. That's what, in man's eyes viewed, you think, well, everybody's done this, so it can't be that bad. Look, just because everybody's doing something, I mean, look at Sodom. Everybody was doing an extremely wicked sin there. It didn't make it okay. It didn't make it any less of a sin just because everybody's involved in something. And, but we have a tendency in a culture and in a society to just overlook certain things and say, well, it's not that bad. Be just because you see it all the time and it's because it's part of your daily life. When it is. And in God's eyes, we have to remember, we need to look at things in God's eyes. God's the one who wrote the laws. God's the one who made the commandments. Just as much as He made the commandment not to commit adultery and not to kill and not to steal, He also made the commandment not to bear false witness. And all these other commandments. And He's the one who, who puts the penalties on our sins. And he's the one that put the penalty of hell for all sin. And we need to get this right concept and this right viewpoint of our sin in the, in, as according to the way that God sees it. And if we start thinking about things in that manner, we'll probably be a lot more likely, one, to try to hate that sin and get out of our life, but also... Um, to just understand the, the seriousness of it so that we, we're not committing it again. Um, turn, if you would, to Proverbs 16. We're in Psalms. Just flip over to Proverbs. Because most people think, you know, I'm a pretty good person. But are you really in God's eyes? You know, Jesus Christ said there is none good but one. And that is God. And this is, that's the big problem with people who, who think that they're going to heaven because they're pretty good. Because they have this view of themselves that says, hey, I'm a pretty good person. I haven't really hurt anybody. You know, I haven't gone out and killed. I haven't committed adultery. I haven't stolen from anybody. I haven't done any of those things. I haven't really hurt anybody. I'm a pretty good person. But Jesus Christ is the one who said, there's none good but one, and that is God. And Jesus Christ was good because he was God in the flesh. By, his, by Jesus Christ's definition of good, none of us is good. Because none of us is God. So, to the people who think that they're going to heaven because they're good, they've got a false understanding and a false view of who they are. They need to get a proper view of themselves in God's eyes that looks at them and says, you are not good. You are a sinner and you deserve this punishment of hell. But if you're in Proverbs 16... The Bible tells us, it says in verse number 2 of Proverbs 16, All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. He's saying, you know, all the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes. According to God, or I mean according to man, they think everything we do is good. Oh yeah, all my ways are good. But God, the Lord, weigheth the spirits. He's the one who tries us. He's the one you know, he weighs them, he, he puts us in the balances, and we're found wanting. Turn to Proverbs 21. It says basically the same thing. Proverbs 21, verse 2 says, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. In man's eyes, we think, oh yeah, I'm doing good. I'm doing right. But God looks at us and says, no, I could see through all the way through to your heart. And I know the wickedness of your heart, and I know the bad things that you've done. Now, when we look in the, way, in, the, in the eyes of the Lord, the most important thing, what matters the most of how we need to view ourselves, obviously, is in regards to salvation. And I've kind of been leading up to this already. Hopefully, when God looks at your eternal status, He doesn't see your sins. But He sees that, that shed blood of Jesus Christ covering you completely. That's what you need in order to be saved and go to heaven, is that you need that blood of Jesus Christ to cover all of your sins. Because we all have sins. 
it, that's why it says in Genesis chapter, turn if you would to Galatians chapter 4, but in Genesis chapter 6, verse 8, the Bible says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In God's eyes, Noah had grace. And what's grace? Grace is something that you don't deserve. Grace is something that someone gives you, but it's undeserved, it's unearned, it's unmerited. Noah was spared from the flood, from that judgment of God upon the earth because God extended grace unto him. And it's a picture of our salvation. God's judgment will come on wickedness and on sin. And there is a judgment of hell associated with our sin. That's why we need God's grace to save us. We need that free gift. Galatians 4 verse 6 says, And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Howbeit then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature's, nature are no gods, but now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? I love this verse because it's, he's, he's making a distinction here that it's not that after you have known God, but what's even more important than you knowing God is God knowing you. And this is key, another key verse for understanding you know, our eternal security. People like to turn to, to Matthew chapter 7, and, and it's funny when, when people who believe you can lose your salvation turn to this verse, because it actually supports just the opposite. In Matthew 7, it says, um, well, let me just turn there so I don't misquote it. Basically, you know, many who come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, you know, have we not done all these, these wonderful works? And God, um, and God shall say, let me, just, let me just read it real quick. He says in verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And here we see that these people are trusting in their works. They say, look, haven't we done all this stuff? They're claiming to know God. They're talking to the Lord. They're not talking to some false idol. They're talking to God and saying, look, God, we've done things in your name. We've cast out devils. We've done these great works. And that's why he's making the distinction here in Galatians 4, 9, that not, you know, after that you've known God or rather are known of God. Because being known of God is more important than you knowing God. These people, I think they knew God but they were trusting in their works for salvation. That's why verse 23 of Matthew 7 says, And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. They weren't known of God. God says, I never knew you. And that's what you need to have in order to be saved. You need to be known of God. God needs to know you because you are born into his family, because you are his son. And if your son, um, that's why I said earlier in Galatians 4, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. God knows his heirs. God knows his children. God knows his adopted children, his sons. But those that aren't his sons, those that aren't born again by believing in Christ, he doesn't know them. And that's why he's going to say, depart from ye that work iniquity. Because they're trusting in something other than Christ to, to, to be saved. This is how God sees things. We need to be known in God's eyes for our salvation. We have to be, we, we need to, to, to have him not see us and see our sins, but have our sins cast behind his back, have our sins separated as far as the east is from the west, have our sins covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, so that when God looks at us, he doesn't see us with, a sinful, with, with our sins, he sees us covered and, and completely completed. Now, that's for salvation. But God's eyes are upon us and are constantly searching. In, in other matters, not just about salvation. That's one aspect of God and how we need to view ourselves in God's eyes. 
But turn, if you would, to 2 Chronicles chapter number 16. We're going to be in 2 Chronicles, and then we're going to be in 1 Samuel. 2 Chronicles 16, and then 1 Samuel 26, if you want to get ahead. 2 Chronicles 16, verse number 7. I'll give you a minute to get there. Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse number 7 says, And at that time Hanani the seer came to Asa king of Judah, and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host? with very many chariots and horsemen, yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Here and thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. Now, we see in verse 9, because we're, we're, again, the title of my sermon is In the Eyes of the Lord, and we're trying to think about how God sees us and what His eyes are doing. What's He looking at up from up in heaven? It tells us here, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. This is what God is looking at to show Himself strong. He's looking for people to use. God wants to show His might. God is extremely powerful. God can do all things. And He wants to show His might to us. He, he likes that when, when He can perform these great miracles and do great things. And that's why it says His eyes run to and for, fro throughout the whole earth to show Himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward Him. But in order for Him to show His might, He needs someone whose heart is right, whose heart is perfect towards Him, who's, who, someone who's ready and willing to rely completely on Him. And Asa did this earlier on in his kingdom as a king. Asa did rely on God. That's why it says, um, that's why he's bringing up, Hanani the seer is bringing up that about how he had escaped already out of when, when they were confronted with a battle. He says in verse 8, Were not the Ethiopians and Lubims a huge host? You had these great armies coming against you with very many chariots and horsemen. Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered. God fought for you because you relied on him. Your heart was perfect towards God. So at that time, he's saying God delivered you. Because God likes these battles when you're hugely outnumbered and you just decide, you know what, we're going to rely on God for this. We're going to trust God to help us through this hard time and we're going to look to the Lord to fight our battles for us because we're His chosen people. We're going to rely on Him and not on our own flesh. God delivered him. God, God did it and he, and he loves doing that. It's, it's, you know, the odds are against you. You're hugely outnumbered, but God will do it. But in this case... He didn't do that. He has this lapse of faith. He's not trusting in God. And Hanani calls him out and he says, look, you've done foolishly. And because you've done foolishly, because you haven't relied on God, he says, therefore, from henceforth, thou shalt have wars. And look what Asa, how he reacts to, to hearing this rebuke. He needed to hear this rebuke. He should have gotten right with God. Verse number 10 says, then Asa was wroth. That wroth just means it's like wrath. He's angry with the seer and put him in a prison house. For he was in a rage with him because of this thing. And Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time. And this is what happens when, you, when you're not right with God and someone points their sin out to you. Don't, don't ever have this type of an attitude where you get angry. You know, we, we all have a different reaction to getting rebuked for our sin. But what you don't want to do is get angry and get in a rage over your own sin. It's only going to lead you to more problem. And when he's in sin, look what he ends up doing. He ends up oppressing other people at the same time. He takes it out on other people. He throws the prophet. The prophet just came to tell him the truth. He's saying, look, you've done foolishly. Now God's judgment is on you. Is it, is it Hanani's fault that God's judgment is on him, is on Asa at all? No, of course not. It's silly. It's stupid to put him in the prison. But he just didn't want to hear it. And oftentimes that's how people react. They don't want to hear the truth. He won't have anything to do with it. But, um, but God is looking to use people 
who are willing to, to um, have a perfect heart towards him and that are interested in knowing the truth. King David was another man. He's a great example. Turn to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 26. We'll see some examples here of King David. King David was a man. He had many enemies. Even people that were really close to him. You think of Saul and even his own son Absalom. They were people who were very close to him as far as relationships go, the people he knew. And they were his enemies. Saul was looking to kill him. Absalom was basically, he, he was looking to kill him too because he was trying to take over the kingdom. He had many enemies. He had people wanting him dead. And there were a lot of people that he had that had different views about David and his tactics and the way that he was doing things. They would question his judgment and the decisions that he made. But David was, and the reason why is because David was more concerned with what God thought than what was and what was right, the right thing to do in God's eyes, than what would benefit him immediately. Uh, and an example of this, what I'm, you know, maybe to help explain what I'm trying to, to talk about here, is look at 1 Samuel 26, verse number 8. We're going to see here we have an, an opportunity to kill Saul. Saul's chasing after David and he wants him dead. Okay? A situation like that, most people will probably be like, well, if he wants me dead, I'm going to kill him. And that's often what happened with, in most cases. If, if you know someone's out to kill you, I'm going to kill him first. But look at, look at what David does. 1 Samuel 26, verse number 8 says, Then said Abishai to David, God hath delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now therefore, let me smite him, I pray thee, with the spear, even to the earth at once, and I will not smite him the second time. So, they, they creep into the camp. They're all sleeping. Saul's on the ground. All his men are sleeping around him. And they creep into camp and no one notices him. And Abishai says to David, he's saying, look, let me just kill him. He's like, I've got my speech. He's like, it's going to take one shot. I will, I will, you know, push my spear through him and I won't have to do it a second time. He'll, he'll be dead. You could, you know, I guarantee you that. And in verse 9, it says, And David said to Abishai, destroy him not. For who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And David maintained this integrity all throughout his life. This, you know, this idea of, hey, if God's anointed somebody, I'm not going to lay my hands to him. I'm going to let God take care of their judgment. He's saying, this is somebody that God anointed to be king. And he's saying, I'm not going to take it into my own hands to, to remove this guy. He's doing wickedly, yes. He's doing wrong and he's, he's out to kill me, but I'm not going to take the judgment into my own hands. I'll let God take care of that because he will. He, he, you know, he says that you know, God will take care of him either in a battle or some other way, but God's going to be responsible for this. I'm not going to put my hand on God's anointed. David had that integrity. He, I mean, he had the perfect opportunity twice. There's this one and the other time when he was in the cave. Both times he could have killed his enemy. He could have received that immediate benefit of, of having slain and, and then he would have you know probably gone to try to take take over the kingdom because the king would have been dead and everything else and this guy who was chasing after him to kill him he'd at least get that relief of not having to worry about that anymore not always being on the run even though he could have had that extreme benefit personally in his life he decided to do what was right in God's eyes. He, he, he thought, first he said, well, how is God going to view this? I want to do what's right in God's eyes, not just what's going to make me um, benefit in the short term. Look at verse number 10. David said, furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall descend into battle and perish. He's saying, look, God's going to take care of this. I don't have to worry about it. Verse number 11. The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed. But I pray thee, take thou now the spear that is at his bolster and the cruise of water and let us go. So he's saying, I'm not going to kill him. You know, God forbid that I should kill this man, but we're going to take these things because then he further on down, jump down to verse number 22. David calls out to him and is like, look, I could have killed you again. You know, I didn't do it. And this is real interesting. Look at verse number 22. It says, And David answered and said, Behold the king's spear, and let one of the young men come over and fetch it. So he's saying, Look, I've got the king's spear. You'll come over here. Send someone over here to come and get it. 
and see, you know, I could have killed you, but I didn't. Verse number 23, the Lord render to every man his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered thee into my hand today, but I would not stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed. And behold, as thy life was much set by this day in mine eyes, so let my life be much set by in the eyes of the Lord. And let him deliver me out of all tribulation. And this is the type of mindset that we need to have. He's saying, look, just as I spared your life, he didn't say to Saul, I want you to spare my life. He says, God can see that I spared his life. God can see what I've done, and in the eyes of the Lord, God can deliver me out of my tribulations. He can see what I've done to other people, and now He can treat me the same way. And this is a very common teaching in the New Testament, right? Where the Bible says, the, the, you know, the famous verse is about turning your other cheek and to forgive those that have persecuted you, and, and you know, basically to, to suffer and to take those things wrongly. And when people do things wrong to you for, for the cause of Christ, to, to just take it and suffer it. Because God's going to see that. God's going to see the way you treat other people. It may benefit you somehow in the short term to recompense an evil done against you. For example, someone's you know trying to get maybe in a more current situation at work someone's trying to get your job and um, you know maybe they they do something against you or try to try to get you to fail and basically try to make you look bad you don't need to go back then and and make them look bad in front of the boss so that the boss fires them let God be the judge and take care of those things. You just stay focused on your work. Now, if someone's lying about you, you need to set the truth straight. Set the truth straight. There's nothing wrong about that. But this is, you know, someone, with David's case, someone's coming to kill him. And he's like, I'm not going to put my hands to him. I'm not going to kill him. I'm going to suffer this to happen because God's going to see the way that, that I'm dealing with this. And I'm praying to God that God, remember this. Remember how I'm dealing with this when I go through my troubles and I go through my tribulations and you can save me out of them. And um, it, it's important to have that mindset of, of the way that God sees things. Let's look at, um, turn if you would to Acts chapter 4. And while you're turning, I'm going to read from 1 Kings 15, just about David summing up. Because we, we hear this over and over again. There's many verses that say this. But in 1 Kings 15.4, it says, Nevertheless, for David's sake did the Lord his God give him a lamp in Jerusalem to set up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem, because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. He's saying, you know, God blessed David quite a bit. Why? Because he did that which was right in God's eyes. He wasn't making all of his decisions based on, well, what is man going to think? Or, or what's the world's wisdom in this situation? It was, what does God think? And we could go into all these different wars that he fought where he went to God to see, hey, should I go against these people? God, what should I do here? God, should I fight these people? God, can I stay here? Are these people going to deliver me up into Saul? And he was always going to God and questioning first, what does God want? What is God saying I should do? And he would go with that. Now, obviously, he committed that great sin of adultery and murder with Uriah the Hittite and Bathsheba. And that's why he says here, look, David did that which was right in the, Lord, in, the Lord, in the eyes of the Lord, except in this matter. It was a very grievous sin, but overall, as a whole, David was going to God first. He backslid here and had a, and had a, very, a very grievous sin. And I don't want to downplay that sin at all because it is very grievous. But the way that David lived his life on the whole was one where he was seeking God first. He was seeing, well, what does God want me to do? And this is the way that we need to try to view our life. Like I said earlier, when we make decisions in our life, when we're guiding our life, especially now, we have already had the sermon this morning about making goals for ourselves and stuff. What is God, how does God view us? How would God view the decisions that we make? That's what always needs to be going through our mind. Not so much, you know, what do I want? 
how is God going to view this? Or what, is, what are other people going to think about me? No, what is God, how does God view this? Are you in Acts chapter 4? Because the apostles, the apostles had the same exact attitude as David. You, you'll see the same, the same or similar attributes among all the greatest men of God, the people who did the most for God. David is exalted all throughout the, the Old Testament as someone who followed the Lord with all of his heart, as someone who did right in the eyes of God. Whenever the kings were, were the good kings were compared to anyone, they're always compared to David, just like the bad kings were compared to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat about how bad they were and how wicked they were. David was kind of a, a really good example of somebody to be compared to because he did right in the eyes of God. Acts chapter 4 verse 17 says, But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them, that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God, to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So here they're being threatened by, by the Pharisees. They're being threatened by those in charge saying, look, you can't talk anymore about Jesus Christ. And again, what are they concerned about? Are they concerned about these magistrates or these Jews or these high priests or whatever they, you know, are, are they concerned about these people in this position of authority? Tell them to not, to not to witness for Christ? No. What they're concerned about, he says, whether it be right in the sight of God. They're, they're concerned with how does God see things. In God's eyes, they're saying, you be the judge. If we should hearken unto you or if we should listen to, job, to, to God. Are we going to listen to what you have to tell us or listen to what God? Because God told us that we need to preach this word. God told us to preach the gospel to every creature, and you're telling us not to. So you judge. Who do you think we should listen to? Should we listen to you or should we listen to God? We're more concerned with how God views us. The same, basically the same thing happens in Acts chapter 5 when they don't listen to him, surprise, surprise, and they just continue to preach anyways, even though they've been threatened. Acts chapter 5 verse 28 says, saying, did, we, did not we, because they got arrested again, did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And their, their attitude hasn't changed. And we need to make sure that we can maintain the same type of attitude that even in afflictions, even if you get arrested, even if you get beat up or threatened or any of these things that happen to the disciples, hey, what is God going to be pleased with? Because that's what matters. And that's what's going to keep you strong through the hard times is thinking about God, thinking about what is He going to be happy with. If you have that, that commitment to God, what everyone else says isn't going to matter. Because what God says matters. Turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're almost done. It's a little bit of a shorter sermon tonight. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. You know, I teach a lot of warnings and, 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 and hopefully things that can build you up and strengthen you. And you might think, you know, Pastor Burson's things aren't really that bad. I don't get that much flack. You know, we still have a lot of freedoms and stuff. But the day is coming when you won't. And I firmly believe that. And we need to make sure that we're ready and that you're able to stand strong now when it is a little bit easier. Now, look, there are tribulations, there are persecutions. And I know we all kind of deal with this in our own way in our lives, whether it be with family or some friends or people that, that kind of look on you weird or different because of what you believe. But the teachings from the Bible these days, they're growing more and more and more unpopular. The, the wicked are getting more wicked and they're, they're in control of the media, and they're, they're having an influence on changing mass amounts of people's opinion, and people are getting attacked more and more for holding views. Um, I think about all this stuff that's been happening with, you know, with Pastor Anderson, with the AIDS, the judgment of God, and now he just released a birth control one. And these were all like normal, common beliefs among the mainstream in America not very long ago, in my lifetime, for sure. I mean, not, what, 20 years ago? 
30 years ago, these things were not that radical. Like, but now it's changed to the point where there is a tax. It's radical. People are just thinking, what in the world? How could you possibly believe these things? And over such a short, over one, the course of like one generation, things have gotten so much more wicked. And you can see how fast things are changing in that direction. It's not going to be much. If, if things continue on this path, it's not going to be long before everything is just on its head. Everything's upended and all the beliefs of the Bible are just going to be looked on as crazy or as nuts or as radical or extreme. And you're going to be suffering, you're having to go through a lot more persecution just to preach the Word of God. And we need to be ready to stand strong. So I hope I don't sound too much like a broken record, but it's really important that we are grounded and founded and that our, our thoughts are always concerned with how God sees things and not so concerned about how other people see uh, see them. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 2, there's a commandment here to Timothy where Paul's saying, preach the word. Be instant. Instant is ready right away, right immediately. Be instant in season, out of season. When things are popular, when they're not popular. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And these are the times that we're living in today when people, do, they can't endure sound doctrine, good doctrine, but because they have their own lust, because they like their own sin, they heap to themselves teachers. They want people just saying, you know what? We don't want to hear what's true from the Bible. Tell me that my sins are okay. I have itching ears. Can you scratch my ear for me, tickle a little bit, and just tell me that I'm just fine and that I am a good person and that everything I'm doing is just fine and God's happy with me and that there is no such thing as judgment? That's what I want to hear. And they find people, because there's people out there that'll tell you whatever you want to hear. You pay them enough money and they'll, pay, they'll tell you anything. And they'll try to make it sound like it's coming from the Bible too. They'll do whatever they can to make you sound, to, to make you real comfortable with where you're at and everything's just fine. The, the, the false prophets are out there in abundance. And these are the days we're living in and people are trying to do this. That's why they're, they're I, the perversions that they're making, even with God's word and the sodomites. Now they're showing the sodomites like going to church, like as if they're Christian. But... They want to have their version of religion and, and, and whatever and, and keep their filthiness too. And um, they're, they're heaping to themselves teachers having itching ears. But this is the, the, the time that we're living in. We are seeing this happen today. Verse number four says, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. They don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to have anything to do with it and shall be turned unto fables. They, they just want to hear fairy tales. They want to hear stories. They want to hear lies that just sound good. Verse number five, he says, But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. We need to make the decision to stand with God. And remember that he is always watching. His eyes are always running to and fro and, and constantly be thinking, what is God seeing and what would be right in his eyes? Don't be so concerned about being pleasing in man's eyes that you, you end up not being pleasing in God's eyes. Now, there's nothing wrong with, with getting along with people and living peaceably as much as is possible with all men, but you don't want to live peaceably so much to the point to where now God's looking at you and he's ashamed of you. And God's looking at you saying, you're not doing what I, what I told you to do. You're not doing what I wanted you to do and you're not doing that which is right in his eyes because you're so concerned about what other people think. Even if you taking a stand for God means you're going to be hated in everyone else's eyes, if the world is just going to look at you and label you as some psychopath, terrorist, hater, whatever, they, whatever labels they want to throw on you, if you're pleasing in God's eyes, that's really all that matters. If God's pleased with what you're doing, that is what matters. And God has given his preachers warnings about this as well. Um, Jeremiah chapter 1, he, he warns Jeremiah, he says in verse 8, Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. If you're going to stand up and do what's right, hey, you don't have to worry about their faces. They're going to give you mean looks. They're going to give you dirty looks. Don't worry about their faces. Don't worry about the things that they say. He says, I'm with you. 
to deliver you. Verse number nine says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And this is another thing that, that you know, maybe it'll be a little bit more comforting for you. Because as human beings, no one wants other people to hate you. You don't want other people to look at you with disgust or, or, or to not like you, right? I mean, we all kind of want to have this natural inclination to want to be liked by other people. I, it's not my goal to just get other people to hate me at all. And, and I don't think that's anybody's. But what we have to understand, like he said here, God's putting his words in Jeremiah's mouth. So when someone hates you because of the stand that you take for the Bible, it's it's really not you that they hate. It's God. It's God's word. If you're proclaiming God's word, just say, you know what? I believe that this is the truth. This is what they hate. It's not you as a person. So you don't, you, if it's any consolation at all, you don't have to take it personally. Right? Now, what they want to do is they want to get you to shut up. They want to make you feel bad. They want to discourage you. They want to make you feel like you're all alone, like they did to Elijah, where Elijah felt like there's nobody else that believes, right? And he's asking God just to kill him. That's what they want to do to you. They want to discourage you, and they're going to try to bring as much persecution as they can upon you. But what they don't hate, it's not you, really, as a person. What they hate is the Bible. What they hate is God's Word. What they hate is what you're repeating, what you're standing for. God gave this similar warning to Ezekiel chapter, in Ezekiel chapter number 2. He gave this similar warning. Because Jeremiah and Ezekiel both had very negative messages to bring to the people. They are not positive. These are not great messages because in Jeremiah, he's teaching that, look, the Chaldeans are going to come, the Babylonians are going to come, and they're going to take you, and they're going to destroy you, and, and we're going to go into bondage. And it's going to be terrible. And you just need to surrender to them and just give up because that's what God's will is right now. You are being judged, and there's no getting out of it. And you just need to listen, right? And that was Jeremiah's message. It wasn't positive. It wasn't saying, hey, you know, we could still turn back to God. God's still going to fight. No, he's saying this is going to happen. It's already been determined. And it came to pass exactly as he, as he prophesied because he was a prophet of God. He was truly speaking God's words, which is why it came to pass. Ezekiel, very similar situation. Okay, He had very negative messages to preach. And in chapter 2, verse 6, he says, And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them. God gives him the same advice. Like, Don't be afraid of these people. I've got a job for you to do. You need to stand up and you need to preach my word. Don't be afraid of them. Neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions. He's saying, I know, you've, you've got dangers all around you. Thorns, scorpions, don't be afraid. He says, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Verse 7 says, and thou shalt speak my words unto them. See, again, he's being commanded to speak God's words. Ezekiel isn't making this stuff up. Jeremiah wasn't making this stuff up. They were preaching God's words. And he says, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. He's like, whether they hear or not, whether they want to listen to you or not, he says, for they are most rebellious. You still need to speak it. You still need to preach what I have you to preach. I, I want you to do this. You need to say this. It doesn't matter if they listen or not. Your job is just to preach it. Verse number 8 says, But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And it's his word that, that he ends up giving him to eat that, he's, that he goes out to preach. And that is our job. We need to be concerned and focused on what we do and how we look in the eyes of the Lord. In God's eyes, when he looks down, what has he done for us to do? What, he's given us a job. One of our jobs is to proclaim his truth, to proclaim the Bible, to proclaim his words, and to stand solid on what he has said for us to do, and not be worried or discouraged or afraid, especially when people come against you and against, against the Bible and against God's word. We need to not be rebellious by backing down and by shutting our mouths. Because too many people have, which is one of the reasons we're in the predicament we're in right now anyways. It's because too many people let themselves get pushed around 
by these sodomites, by the, the wicked haters of God that are out there that just are, are just promoting as much filth and as wickedness as they can to desensitize people. And, and none of the good Christians, none of the good men are standing up and saying anything against it. And the less of that that's happening, the more the wickedness is going to abound because they are very loud and they are very vocal. And they're going to try to cram their wicked agenda down your throat. But it's when, when, the, when the good men of God, when God's eyes are running to and fro and there's nobody there to use, there's nobody that has a perfect heart toward God, there's no one that's willing to just say, God, I'm willing to preach your words. I'm willing just to, to make a stand and say, I just believe, I believe what you said, God, and I'll be able to tell other people the same thing. We need more men like that today. To just say, I believe this book. These are God's words. God's the one that said, you know, homosexuality is a sin that's punishable by the death penalty. God's the one that said that adultery is a sin that's punishable by the death penalty. God's the one that said that kidnapping is a sin punishable by the death penalty. God's the one that said all these things and I believe it. And God's right and you're wrong if you don't believe it. And if people want to call you nuts or ignorant or whatever words they want to say, I'm not going to be afraid of what they have to say. And hopefully you won't be either. But let's focus intently in our life, when we make decisions and all the things that we do, is, God, is what I'm doing pleasing in the eyes of God? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Lord, thank you so much for your words, for the Bible, dear God, for these great words of wisdom. God, help us always to, to measure ourselves against your words and against what you've told us, dear Lord, and that we would be reminded from time to time and think about how you view things because oftentimes they're different than the way we view things and measure everything and stack everything up against your words against what you've already told us on whether or not what we're doing is right or acceptable or good in your sight dear Lord we know that we're sinners we know that that we've done wrong and that we're really not good in the true sense of the word because of Jesus said there is none good but one and that is God and we're definitely not you dear Lord um, we need your mercy and your forgiveness, but um, help us to be able to evaluate our lives, dear Lord, and to do only those things which are pleasing in your sight, that, that we can live a life like David or Job or any of these other great examples, the Apostle Paul, dear Lord, that, that over and over again we're doing things that were pleasing in your sight, dear Lord, and, and strengthen us and keep us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.